When you add salt to water and stir it, it will dissolve. Add more salt and it will dissolve. But you cannot just do that indefinitely. At some point, you will reach a limit and the salt will no longer dissolve. In other words, there is a maximum concentration of salt that you can reach in water. This limiting amount of salt you can dissolve is known as salt's solubility in water. If your particular solution is at that concentration, it is said to be saturated. If your solution is below that concentration, it is said to be unsaturated. If you somehow manage to generate a solution that exceeds its solubility, it is said to be supersaturated. Let's recall what the dissolution process is in chemical terms. The solute, in this case sodium chloride, dissociates into sodium and chloride ions in water. The reverse of this process is precipitation. Now notice that I have written this precipitation reaction in a particularly provocative manner, from right to left instead of left to right. This will hopefully suggest to you that these two reactions can be combined into a dynamic equilibrium. When you have saturated your solution, there is undissolved salt sitting at the bottom of the beaker. The solid salt and the dissolved ions are in dynamic equilibrium with each other. We're going to look a bit more closely at three categories of solutions. Gases in liquids, liquids in liquids, and solids in liquids, because the behaviors of these classes can be somewhat different from each other. For gases and liquids, we find that uniformly solubility goes down with increasing temperature. This should make intuitive sense, because the higher the kinetic energy the system has available, the larger the fraction of gas molecules will have enough energy to escape their dissolved state into the gas phase. We also find that the solubility depends on the external partial pressure of that gas. This should also make intuitive sense, because when we look at the dynamic equilibrium of the dissolution process, the more molecules of gas we have bouncing against the surface of the solvent, the faster the forward dissolution reaction will be, shifting the equilibrium in the direction of more dissolved gases. This behavior is governed by Henry's Law, which says that the concentration of a gas is directly proportional to the partial pressure of that gas over the solvent. The proportionality constant will depend on the temperature, the solvent, and the gas. This is the phenomenon that allows for carbonated beverages. An overpressure of carbon dioxide is applied to a soft drink, forcing a lot of the gas to dissolve in the drink. When the can is opened, the excess pressure is released, leaving a solution supersaturated in carbon dioxide, which slowly comes out of solution as bubbles. Some liquids can mix with each other in any proportion, a condition we call miscible. Ethanol in water, ethylene glycol in water, motor oil and gasoline. These are all miscible combinations. Typically, the types of intermolecular forces need to be the same for two liquids to mix. So for water, you need something with hydrogen bonding. For gasoline, you need something nonpolar. Other combinations don't mix and are called immiscible. Oil and water is the canonical example, but really pretty much anything that doesn't allow hydrogen bonds will be immiscible with water. But of course, the categories aren't always neatly divided. We can look at a miscible pair of liquids like this. The two liquids mix into a single phase at any ratio, and in all cases we have a single phase present. Changing the ratio continuously changes the properties of the mixture. An immiscible pair of liquids, on the other hand, looks like this. In every proportion, you have two phases, and they are completely distinct. In between these two extremes is partially miscible. In this situation, a little bit of liquid B can dissolve in liquid A, or a little bit of liquid A can dissolve in liquid B. But in between, there are two phases, each consisting of a different mixture of the two. Very often, the positions of the transitions between one phase and two phase regions can be temperature dependent, meaning that above or below a certain temperature, a partially miscible pair of liquids may become fully miscible. Finally, we'll talk about the solubility of solids in liquids. In many, but not all, cases, the solubility of solids will increase with increasing temperature. This property is used quite often in chemical syntheses to purify compounds. By dissolving the product in a solvent at one temperature, and then changing the temperature to a point where the solubility is lower, pure crystals of the product can often be precipitated. 